If you've been exercising some leadership skills with a toddler by the time they hit three, piece of cake. They respect you, piece of cake. If you haven't been exercising any leadership skills by the time they get to three, a disaster. That's when the poop hits the fan. I want to also just bring this around. I keep trying to um, get this back to the fact that everyone asks me about discipline because that's what you're struggling with the most, right? But discipline is a very tiny part of what I teach. Leadership is everything. Leadership is about playing with your kids, having fun with them, making them feel good about themselves. If your kids like themselves and they have high self-esteem, it's because you're guiding them to make good choices. And that's what this is all about. You're not telling them what to do. You're guiding them into making good choices. I used to tell my kids, you can do whatever you want. But if you make a bad choice, it's my job to have a consequence for you, to teach you how to be accountable. So you see, I never told my kids what to do. I said, well, the rule is this, you know, whatever. And then if you don't do it, it's my job to correct you, to have a consequence, because that's how we all learn through being accountable, right? Um, that's why we pay rent. We don't want to be kicked out. We pay taxes so we don't go to jail. We don't shoplift because we don't want to get picked up and handcuffed. You know what I mean? We operate through being accountable. So you got to teach that to your children. So how to best manage kids with angry outbursts. Set yourself up as a leader and it tends to regulate their emotions. If they have angry outbursts, they feel like you're out of control. It's usually uh, it's a reflection of your parenting. Um, uh, not so much under the age of three, they're just nuts anyway. Three and above, especially by the age of three and a half and four. Tantrums should be going away. Angry outbursts should be gone because they, they feel taken care of. Leaders make them feel safe. And kids who feel safe don't tend to have angry outbursts. Uh, leadership is safety. Makes them feel safe. You know what? This was, I haven't told this story in a while. Anyway, a whole bunch of us moms were in a uh, grade two class. And I, I was used to, I was in there a lot supporting the teachers. It was just what I did. Like, um, uh, no, I was just in there volunteering. But I was like a behavioral um, mentor to, for the kids or just as teacher support, whatever you want to call it. But it was all free. I just did a volunteer. Anyway, all the moms, the way I talk and that, they thought I was so tough. And they were, we were laughing. And I always said, oh, God, I hate kids. We have to go in there. And the moms are all laughing. I'll do anything for a laugh, right? Anyway, so we all split up into groups. And the moms couldn't figure out why my group, those kids were all happy. They were well-behaved. They were having fun. Their groups were running circles around them. They couldn't control them at all. So mine was the only controlled group. So the, the parents were, later on, they said, we just thought it was, you were so nasty. They were afraid of you, but they were having fun, right? So anyway, I know how to get good behavior out of kids. So anyway, an unscheduled fire alarm went off and it scared the kids because it was not, they weren't warned about it. They were only grade two. It scared them. They didn't run to the teacher only because she was a younger teacher and she wasn't super experienced. If it was an older experienced one, like a leader, they would have, but they didn't run to her and they didn't run to the parents. Most of the kids ran to me. Now, why would they do that? Because I'm a leader. It makes them feel safe, right? Because I, I always look like I know what I'm doing. That's what it is. I always look like I know what to do. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Here's what's going to happen. That's the way I talk to kids. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Stuff like that. And you get into this routine with kids, they just tend to look at you. I need help with bedtime. Okay, check out my Bedtime Battles course. It's one of my mini courses. It's up in the link above. And it's called Bedtime Battles. It's from two to eight years old. It's in two parts, how to get them to bed and then how to keep them there. Um, the second part's the hard one. It's easy to get them in bed, hard to keep them there. So yeah, it's, it's a night of hell. Yeah. But the worse the night, the better the results usually. I was just on your page looking for help. My three-year-old has made a 180 and has started and has started hitting pushing. Okay, my three-year-old. Okay, that's what I was just talking about. The three three is a fork in the road. If you've been exercising some leadership skills with a toddler by the time they hit three, piece of cake. They respect you, piece of cake. If you haven't been exercising any leadership skills by the time they get to three, a disaster. That's when the poop hits the fan because that's at three years old they stop and think oh, wait a minute, you're not in charge. You don't know what you're doing. I think I'll take over. It's almost like they do that. They stop and think. I see it all the time. It's right around three. It's not before. It's usually right around three or just after. Yeah, it's that fork in the road. So yeah, check out my boot camp course. It starts at the age of three. And um, But yeah, it's all about your leadership. And remember, we're not fixing kids. We're teaching parents here. I teach you leadership skills. You lead, they will follow. I've worked with hundreds of kids. Do you think that it, I just lucked out on that one particular hour I worked with them and got respect? No, I'm a leader. I know how to get respect with kids. Sometimes it's more challenging, for sure, for sure, especially with the troubled teens. That uh, didn't happen overnight. I had to put a good couple of weeks into them. 
Um, but yeah, eventually I know how to get respect and you will too. If you follow through all this stuff, it just makes sense. It's setting you up as a leader. Children need, crave and want leadership. If you're not a leader for your child, you're going to send them out in the world. Very vulnerable, very susceptible to peer pressure, bullying, the drug dealer on the corner, the internet, the Kardashians. In other words, they're going to go searching for a leader elsewhere. You want to be that leader. Now, are leaders dictators? Do you want obedient soldiers? That's crap. Of course not. You want kids who have a say. My kids, believe me, they had a say in what went on. They had a voice. You want, you're want you the leader, though. That You're like a mentor. They look up to you. You're best friends. You're someone they can tell everything to. You're a safe place to land. And they look up to you. They want to please you. And by the time they're teenagers, they just don't want to disappoint you. But they still tell you everything because they don't know how not to because you're their leader, right? They trust you. So it, it's about building them up. Not, not cutting them down so that they come to you for everything. It's not like that. It's not because you're the boss kind of thing. It's more building them up to make good choices. I used to say to my kids, if you're good, life is good. If you're bad, life ain't so good. I'll make sure of it because I'm your mom and that's my job. In other words, I'm going to make you accountable for your actions. Right? That's all you're doing here. You're just making them accountable. So you deal with bad behavior, then you focus on the good kid. The pool story is pinned. It's the very first video on my page on Instagram and TikTok. I don't know about Facebook yet. I don't know. I don't do my social media, but I did pin it on TikTok. I'm, I did all my own TikTok for the first year and a half. Um, and then now I've got someone doing that for the last six months who is way better at it than I am. Um, so I do know how to pin on TikTok. Anyway, it's the very first video and it's example of leadership parenting. It is by far my, be my best video to explain what, how I see leadership parenting. You, I, don't let, I don't take any crap. I don't let anything go. How you deal with bad behavior, then you flip it really fast and focus on the good kid. And the results you get are wonderful. But your kids know you as not being that way. So it's going to be harder to erase. you got to sort of erase their memory of the old you first. So it's going to get worse before it gets better, for sure. What's your thoughts on, okay, I'm going to answer this. It's so not me, but I'm going to, I'm going to read it out and tell you why. What's your thought on natural consequences? My toddler just threw a tantrum and was kicking something in our sock and got, in our, got stuck and she was mad. Okay, I don't know. Like if she's trying to hit the wall, it hurts her hand. Just kind of a natural consequence. You never discipline for a tantrum. A tantrum is not bad behavior. A tantrum is a loss of emotional control at not getting what they want, when they want, how they want it. You completely ignore that. You never discuss a tantrum before, during, or after, ever. Any attention you give a tantrum is fertilizing it. Don't give it any attention at all. Uh, yeah. What you get, what, where you put your attention, where you put your energy is what grows, okay? So you just ignore tantrums. When they're done, you might say, you want to read a book? When they're done. But yeah, the natural consequences, I never, I never would punish for a tantrum, ever. It's like punishing a kid for crying. It's the same thing. Yeah, you don't do that. They're just mad because they didn't get their own way. You do not validate those feelings. You do not need to validate every single thought and feeling a child has. You do not need to validate their feelings because they don't like the word no. There's no freaking way I would validate that. It's garbage. Let's discuss all your big feelings and big emotions. That's crap. It's absolutely ridiculous. Gotta get mad at that because I have to fix all that later on. That backfires down the road, by the way. That please your parent trying to validate everything and please them all the time. It's a, it's a nightmare. So I have to fix that as the years go by. It backfires and then parents hire me and tell me what they were doing. And um, I don't go into all that, of course, because I'm solution based. I don't discuss problems. But yeah, we all know what's going on. It would sort of be like a teacher teaching parenting. They're very different roles. Some stuff crosses over. One thing that works beautifully in a classroom is behavior boards. Not behavior boards, sorry. Reward charts. Reward charts are you get a gold star or something for good behavior, right? Um, a total disaster at home. A lot of teachers use that at home and they can't figure out why it's such a disaster. And I say, here's why. A reward chart at school is not personal. There's 30 kids on there. It's not personal. Plus, you're not personal. You're a teacher. It's a business. It's an institutional relationship, basically. You can get close to them, but it's still the number one role is institution. You're a business, right? And then at home, though, it's different. It's personal. It's just you and your kids. And you put a reward chart up. You know what you're telling your kids? You're normally rotten. If you should happen to be good, I know how to deal with it. Like I'll give you, a, I'll give you a reward. You should happen to be good. See the, what the message that you're sending your kids? I, I never reward for good behavior because that's my baseline expectation. The behavior board says you're normally wonderful, but if you're not, there's a behavior board there to deal with it. You see? See the difference? 
Some of my clients are surprised at this, but I would never use a behavior board. I've never used one. I invented that as a teaching tool. Um, like I don't want to give that board any, there's no way I would give that board any control because I want it. I want, the, I want right here and I'm dealing with it. But when you're learning this, it's great to have that buffer. The, the board takes some of the pressure off of you. A lot of people use me as leverage too. Well, we paid a lot of money to this woman. She's tough. She told us to do this. We have to do it. She's our teacher. So a lot of people, and then they'll, the kids really get on. What did she say this week? What did she say that week? So it's sort of taking some of the, the pressure off of you. That's why I do. And also you're on there. It's teaching you how to be accountable. Leaders are accountable. You're not a dictator. You don't want obedient soldiers. That's horrible. I want kids to have a voice. I want them to have high self-esteem, like themselves, feel good about themselves. That's what leadership's all about. Three-year-old likes to run off. That's an easy one. you got a runner. There are four things kids are born to do or they're never going to do. One is tantrum. One is climbing. One is running. Climbing and running often go together. They have no fear, right? They're the, they're the fearless ones. And then the last one is uh, hitting. So they're either born and they're going to do it or they're never going to do it. It's, they're born with that basic nature. Um, so yeah, runners just put a harness on them before you go out. And then as soon as they start to run away from you, you clip them in and say, you do not run from me. And you keep them clipped in for the rest of that outing. I know it's difficult. So do a few, uh, some practice runs, places that you don't have to go, right? So you can practice because they're going to have a fit when they're clipped in. And that's what you want behind every fit scene, tantrum or meltdown. There's a lesson without those, how, you know, you got to go through this. If you're struggling with their behavior, you got to go through the transition. The transition is tantrum, fit, scene, meltdown. So Behind every fit scene, meltdown, tantrum, there is a lesson. That's what you want. Just stay calm. I don't feel like talking about it because everyone knows already. If you, most people are regulars, uh, how you handle a tantrum. I've got lots of videos on that. So you can just look, tan look up tantrums um, in my pages. How to get a four and a half year old to poop on the potty. Completely potty trained, but still refuses to poop on the toilet. It's mostly boys. Happens a lot. It's extremely common. It's in my potty training, my potty party course. Um, but you don't need that because he's already potty trained. It's just a fear of pooping. It's actually in the course, though. If, you also, if you're also going through the course, this is all in there. Anyway, the reason why they don't want to poop on the toilet, there's three reasons. Usually, there might be something different, but this is usually what it is. Number one is, well, it's not numbered, but it's actually number two we're talking about. <laughs> anyway, okay, is they don't like the splashback. So if they pooped in the toilet and they got the splashback, the reason why it's more common with boys They've got more equipment hanging down there, so they get more stuff splashed on. That's why it's more common with boys. Um, also, they can stand up and pee, usually, and they don't want to sit down. So that's another part of it, too. But anyway, especially as they get a little bit older. The other one is the hang phobia. They're used to having poop smashed up inside their pants or whatever. All of a sudden, it's out hanging, and it pulls, and they don't like that feeling. So it's the, the uh, tug, that tugging feeling they don't like. Or the third one is they just don't like a cold bum. So hike the heat up in the bathroom, use a little porta potty and put the bottom, put a bunch of toilet paper in there. So when they sit down, they're pretty much touching the bottom anyway. And they say there's no water to splash back. And you see you can, and then their poop will actually touch the bottom while they're still going. So they won't get the hang and then they're warm. So um, sorry about all the graphic stuff, but I didn't go into this graphic as I usually get. If I'm doing this in coaching, <laughs> It's more graphic. But anyway, that's about it. Give it a go. So get a little porta potty, put some toilet paper in there so they can feel it on their bum and tell them there's, and hike up the heat. Say there's no splashing and there won't be any hanging because the poop's going to hit the bottom and you'll be nice and toasty warm. Okay, so give that a go. And no shame. By the way, anything to do with bodily functions, you cannot put any shame around that. None. Just say, yeah, oh, well, big deal. Sometimes I poop my pants too. You just laugh it off. Say, it's no big deal, okay? But here's how we're going to fix it. When you talk like that, kids tend to listen. Okay, no big deal. Poop in your pants. Lots of people do it. I've done it every, you know, just have, you know, you know what I mean, make light of it. And then say, here's what we're going to do to fix it, okay? And yeah. Uh, trying to double consequences has been life-changing in our house. I haven't needed to do the media blackout once. Wow. Okay is that there's, uh, she's using my behavior board, that's free in the link above, she's using my behavior board, and she there's two consequences for the kids for each behavior board. You will end up having three behavior boards, okay? One rule per board for everybody. You include, everybody in the family over the age of three is on, three and over is on there. Anyway, the con there's two consequences for the kids, not for the parents, because you're gonna do it anyway, but they might not do the consequence. The first consequence is a positive action. If they refuse to do that in the time allotted too, it's not just doing it, it's you have to do it by a certain time or you have to do a certain amount of things and a certain time, um, then you revert to the negative deprivation one, which is media blackout usually. Uh, if you don't use screens, it's just taking a favorite toy away. 
So the first one is a positive action. The second one is a negative deprivation. So what the, this parent is saying is they haven't even needed to go to media blackout because that's enough of a threat that the kids just do the first consequence, which is a positive action. So like if an example of that would be if you hit your sister, now you have to let her play with your favorite toy for 10 minutes. So that usually only works with an older sibling hits the younger because the, the older sibling doesn't usually want the younger sibling's toy. You know what I mean? But yeah, the younger one's thrilled to get something of the older ones and the older one just sits there like this. <laughs> It's a good one. That's one of those simple disciplines, uh, consequences that works wonders. So my clients tell me my feedback, most of my feedback comes from my coaching. Um, so yeah, uh, that's what they tell me. They love that one. They say, you should see him sitting there miserable. And it's often a toy they weren't even playing with, but they just hate the fact that they hit their little sister or little brother. And then their little brother's playing with their favorite toy like this. Well, oh, this is great for like 10 minutes. <laughs> They're just like this. It's great, but they don't tend to hit them again. You see, it's, it's they're learning. You're mean to someone, you got to be nice to them. Our boys four and uh, six fight over toys or I just rough and wrestle all the time until one gets hurt. Uh, curb weight. Okay, is there a good way to curb that? Sort of, but they're going to get rough anyway, generally, little boys. If they already have that tendency in them, they're kind of going to, that's going to be a lifelong thing probably. They'll probably be teenagers going at it too. Not necessarily in a bad way. Um, but anyway, uh, how to get siblings to get along is a lot of parents try and stop the bad behavior, or but they forget to teach them the good behavior. So you get involved in their play, not necessarily the wrestling, but you get involved in their play and show them how to do it maybe in a better way. So you got to get involved in that. So rather than just focusing on what you want to stop, show them what you want to start doing. You know what I mean? Show them how to play nicer. Um, good luck with that. That's kind of involved because I don't know exactly what they're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you ever discuss how to handle joint custody where parents have very different parenting styles? Absolutely. That's a big part of my job um, is dealing with that. It's really good if I can talk to both those parents. It's rare, uh, but it, it happens. Sometimes it can happen. So what happens is one parent hires me and then I, I would like to talk to the other one just to sort of get some stuff on the same page, but you don't have to. They only need one leader. If you're the leader, they're going to end up being under your umbrella when it comes to their behavior and the way that they view themselves. Their self-esteem will be attached to you. So they tend to behave according to their own self-esteem, their own set of values, and that's you. So that's that's what we do. So I don't need to talk to the other person. Sometimes I can, though. It's you know, And sometimes the parent that I say, you know what, I really need to talk to that your ex. Is it possible? And they'll say they'll never talk to you. Sometimes they will. So you have to forfeit one of your sessions to give to the other one. Uh, any tips for getting a kiddo to bed? She will be three in May and it takes an hour to get her to bed. And she won't. OK, so check out my bedtime battles course because it's a whole system, like a whole process. And it's in two parts. The first part is how to get them in bed. That's the easy part. The second part is how to keep them there. That's the hard part. It can be a night of hell, just warning you. But it's short term pain for long term gain. So it's worth it. Hopefully, anyway, no guarantees with any of this. We're dealing with human beings here. I know someone uh, emailed me the other day about coaching. Can you guarantee results with my teenager? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, if you can find someone who can and can follow through on that, can you let me know? Yeah, we're human beings. You know, there's no guarantees with any of this. I've got a pretty good success rate with clients. I'm proud of it, but there's no guarantees with any of this. How can I hire you for one-on-one -on -one help? My son's autistic and I need some help parenting him. Yeah, autism is something I only deal with in coaching. If you want to look at coaching, it's in the description on YouTube or it's in the link. Where am I? On Facebook. I don't, I don't do my social media, so I don't really understand it. <laughs> it's in the bio or the description in, on Facebook. So uh, you can look into it. I can't always take new people on. I took a couple new ones on yesterday and the day before uh, because some current clients had finished their fifth sessions so um okay i have an extremely advanced six-year-old who's out of control behavior wise very jealous of little brother grieving his dad who passed away two years ago yes sorry about that and we've moved so there's a lot of transitions in that kid's life that's tricky um they like structure um new school any advice on helping to process grief and control his temper well I lost my dad when I was 14. He got sick when I was 10. So I know what it's like to grieve as a child and go through that. Um, you know, everyone's a bit different, but I understand it. 
and they tend to process it. It keeps popping up throughout the years because you get older and you process it from a 12-year-old brain. Then you process it from an 18-year-old brain. Everything you've missed and everything you're going to miss. So it's a lifelong process. I've been through a lot in my life. I'm 63 years old now. I lost my dad when I was 14. My mom died when I was 55. Uh, in my arms, it was a beautiful goodbye, but she was 93, so it's different. But you know, the hardest thing I've ever been through was losing my father when I was 14. I've been through a lot. I've had miscarriage. I've had lots of stuff go on and lost a lot of loved ones. But yeah, that was the hardest thing because of my age. Uh, so I understand grief. Anyway, if you want to look into coaching, that's what that would be. So you can check it out. I can't always take new people on. just depends what's going on in my life. Plus, if I get a bunch of crisis clients coming my way, I take them on first. So um that would almost be an, I would put that grieving dad, that's a big deal to me because it's so personal for me to have gone through it. So yeah, put down uh, coaching grieving dad if you want to work with me. Check out the coaching, it's in the link above. Everything's in, in the link above. My free behavior board, my mini toddler courses, my big boot camp course, uh, or you can look into coaching.